I'm Ted Bonanno. I'm, I'm uh, just uh, going to do a little introduction on behalf of the ACC San Diego Chapter Board. Um, thank you very much for uh, Higgs, Fletcher, and Mac, and Mike Burns for giving us a webinar today on uh, the pitfalls of M&A. And uh, Mike is a partner in the Higgs uh, office in San Diego, a uh, member of the corporate and securities and real estate practice groups, and uh, an authority in this area. So I appreciate you uh, doing this for us today, Mike, and uh, for those who are able to join. And it looks like this is being recorded. So uh, if anyone has to drop, you can watch the rest of it at a later date. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. Thank you, Ted. And nice to meet everybody. Um, thank you to the ACC for allowing Higgs Fletcher Mac to present today. Uh, as Ted indicated, I'm part of the corporate group of Higgs Fletcher Mac. I've been practicing for 15 years now uh, as a corporate lawyer with an emphasis in mergers and acquisitions. And say over the past uh, seven years, almost exclusively, probably 95% in the M&A space, we represent more sellers than we do buyers. Um, the nature of our client base, uh, we own a lot of, uh, we represent a lot of family owned businesses and uh, entrepreneurs. So I find myself on the sell side probably 70% of the time. And this presentation is slightly tilted uh, to the sell side perspective, although I highlight uh, relevant buy side issues um, along the way. Um, I have the chat open and um, I'm going to try to leave 10 minutes towards the end to answer questions and I'll, I'll just answer them in the order that they come in and uh, I'll make myself available after as well. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start by offering um, or asking a question, how many people here have actually been um, on the ground level of an M&A transaction and and whether that was a positive or a negative experience. And feel free to comment in the chat box. I, I'm told a lot that the experience is negative um, by people who've been in a deal, whether it be an advisor or a principal. And um, I, I think the reason for that is it, it is inherently stressful, but also uh, oftentimes people don't, want to take control of the transaction and create a plan, an action plan, um, and spread out the work over an extended period of time and prepare prior to actually engaging with a buyer. And my philosophy is if I'm given the runway um, and a client wants to go to market, then I highly recommend that we we put together the team uh, and and dig into the analysis and assign responsibilities at an earlier stage so that everybody can keep their sanity. Um, there's a lot of pressure put on the owner, of course, but oftentimes the owner is, is not, not there on the ground level day to day working in the business and the owner's delegated to other individuals um, the responsibility to run the organization. And then I come in and act as, as a quasi boss myself, instructing various people within the organization um, as to you know, giving them assignments, hunting down information, it becomes a second job. So if there's nothing um, that you take away from this presentation other than, than that, then I think that's good. Planning is the, is the common theme here. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna open up my screen share here and start the presentation. Okay, can everybody see that? Ted, you wanna give me a thumbs up? You're the only one I see, okay. <laughs> yes. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go right to the ends because this is about the common common pitfalls. Um, so in a way, it's it's negative, but, but I truly believe that a deal doesn't have to be negative. Um, I think that if one was to plan and to delegate appropriately, um, that we can get through the transaction efficiently. So there is no easy button, 
But as long as we're planning, we're having thoughtful discussions, we have the right team of advisors around, there's no one person that can do it all. Um, and everyone's willing to put in a little bit of extra hard work, which is necessary, absolutely, then it's a very feasible proposition. Um, and so I'll, I'll start with that and I'll, I'll go back to the first slide here. So the, the team um, in a typical deal, I'll, I'll say starts with the investment banker um, and the attorneys in a lot of ways. The investment banker, uh, I think a lot of sellers will get cold feet because they hurt here about the investment banker's success fee and how large that is. And I see closing statements all the time and I can attest to that. It's usually 10 times the size of our fees, but a good investment banker brings a lot of value through the relationships that they've built in the industry, relationships with money buyers, private equity, hedge funds, and uh, knowledge of what value is. And so I, I've seen a lot of my clients think that they can do it on their own. They sell themselves short because they feel like they know they have a good deal. And I've seen a $5 million deal roughly um, fall apart. Uh, the, the client had a relationship. They thought, great, this is a strategic buyer. $5 million is a, is a good price. I don't need an investment banker. It fell apart. Um, I encouraged this person to hire a quality investment banker and the company ended up selling for $18 million. Um, now, albeit it was a little over a year later, but the client was uh, was certainly satisfied with the, the change in circumstances there. Um, attorneys, obviously, we, we all can support the need for, for attorneys in a deal. M&A attorney like myself tends to quarterback the deal. There's lots of different areas organizationally that an M&A attorney needs to have an, a, a, an understanding in, uh, but we're not an expert, obviously, in every space. So we need to be able to identify where additional expertise is needed. And we bring in those, those experts as necessary. A tax attorney is obviously critical in at the front end in particular, so that we know uh, how we're structuring a transaction, um, asset, uh, stock, merger. There's various iterations of what the structure might look like. And an asset deal isn't necessarily always better than a stock deal. And so it's just highly fact dependent. And then at the estate side, all of these are relevant with respect to the seller and the buyer. And depending on those individual circumstances, the estate attorney could drive the structure in a lot of ways, depending on what the family uh what, what their goals are. So that's a really important piece that I've seen missed a lot. And the thing with the estate attorneys is they really need to be brought in at a very early stage because some of the transactions that they engage in and the irrevocable trust planning require lead time. We don't want to create an irrevocable trust and fund it the next day um, with the sale proceeds. Um, depending on what structure you're looking at, the IRS can look at that as, as suspect. So that's an important person to get in. That focuses on transactions, not necessarily one that just prepares monthly financials or um, does a tax return. Somebody who has a real working knowledge of, of deals. I mean, I would say that on average, once we have a buyer and a seller in agreement at the LOI stage, a deal can take anywhere from two to seven months, um, two months for a, a proper transaction. And, and we, we tend to represent middle market, um, lower size transaction values might be around 10 million and we've gone up to several hundred million. And for those deals, which I would characterize as, as a typical deal, when the buyer on the other side is a professional buyer, whether it be private equity or a sophisticated strategic buyer, uh, there's gonna be a lot of work. And so two months is very compressed. And it's important that all of the individuals involved, again, not just the ownership, uh, we're gonna be leveraging the experience and the knowledge of, of this, 
CFO, uh, obviously uh, general counsel is, is a huge, huge component um, that has historical knowledge of lots going on within the organization. Um, if there's a treasurer or accounting department, all of those um, individuals will, will be really key players. And, and for that reason, and everybody should understand kind of what they're about to get into so that um, there's continuity because sometimes there's burnout and burnout is not really good for a deal when it's the key person that you're relying on that's, that's burning out. So transparent conversations with the appropriate people at the outset is really important to set expectations. Uh, and then on, on the sell side, <clears throat> Obviously, we're doing a lot of work before we even get a buyer. And we're, we're working with the investment bankers and they're putting together their teasers and their information memorandums on the company. And then they go to market. Um, and that's a very strategic thing. It's not blast out the company information to 200 or 300 known buyers, but uh, it's more thoughtful than that. And, and it's we just go through the process. So by the time we have a buyer, the seller would have already been at least at least three months into the into the transaction was that a question sorry diana i i heard something oh no sorry oh okay <laughs> uh okay cost this cost is the one thing that uh, we know that there's going to be a, a significant cost to a deal just the nature of the amount of work that's required. And it's not just an attorney cost. Uh, the CPAs will present a significant cost. Um, on, on the sell side, we're going to want to get a quality of earnings report, which is uh, a, a real deep dive on the company's financials and accounting practices so that we can uncover where there are concerns. We can uncover what the quality of the earnings are, are they reliable? Are the financials something that we can project off of or do they need to be adjusted? Absolutely critical um, component of a transaction. And if we don't do that on the sell side, then we're gonna be negotiating with the buyer's quality of earnings team and we're not gonna have any good information to use to negotiate with. And it will be, um, it, it frankly would be an unfair and uninformed negotiation. So something that I recommend is getting a quality of earnings team um, involved to consult on the deal. Uh, but depending on the deal size, a half a percent to 4% of the transaction value could very well be tied up in, in fees. Um, again, highly fact specific, but that's a, a generic average. And I'll note that the cost of a deal does not necessarily go up proportionally with the size of the deal. Um, I've had deals that one that I'm closing here in the near term is a very, very difficult transaction, although it's one of the smallest deals that I've done in the last seven years. And the costs are, are disproportionately high for this transaction. And there's various reasons for that. Um, but as a general rule, there is some level of proportionality between cost and deal size, but that's not always the case. Um, one of my easiest deals I've ever done was one of my largest deals I've ever done. So hard, hard to predict. Um, getting the right people in at the early stage will create a cost. Um, but once we're in deal time, we're going to know the various issues, theoretically, uh, financially accounting, legal, operational, such that when we're presented with a purchase agreement from our buyer um, or we're presented with a, a problem that somebody is raising, we're ready to pivot, we're ready to respond. And, and that, from an optics standpoint, looks really good with our counterpart, um, as opposed to being flat-footed and um, learning about the issue right then and there. Um, psychological factors, very stressful, depending on the circumstances. A, a deal is very stressful. And, and I think it, from an owner's standpoint, um, it could because they, they get emotional about the company. 
Uh, they've been involved with the company for a long time, so they have strong opinions from, from everyone else's standpoint. It could simply be because they now have two full-time jobs and uh, they're trying to do both of them well and, and still have a family and, and, and a personal life. So that that is the problem um, with a transaction that's not well planned, that's compressed, uh, and where we don't have a lot of time. It's also important to note that um, the level of inquiry that a buyer will make and, and that they need to make regarding a target is significant. Um, to put it nicely, they want to know everything. And clients um, are sometimes taken aback, even offended at times, if their expectations are appropriately set in this regard. Um, we, we really need to have everyone on board that we're going to be diving headfirst in this deal, and it's, it's, it's going to be a lot of work. So um, we need to be prepared for this level of inquiry on the sell side. And, and on the buy side, when we're engaging targets, having open communication about what a deal is going to look like is really important because we don't want to convey that this is going to be a really simple transaction um, and that nobody needs to worry about all of the lawyerly things and the diligence and, and all of that only to present to them a 90 page purchase agreement that is really complex. Um, that can be a put off. And I've seen that a lot and it's not a good approach. So that, um, I would say that's me when, when I am in the middle of a deal on the sell side and, and the buyer um, on a group call raises an issue that we, that I have no idea about. Um, it happened recently where uh, the a vendor a key vendor, the client, and the buyer team were on a call, and the key vendor asked the buyer what they planned to do with the second location. The problem was that nobody ever discussed a second location, and we were close to closing. And this was a really big deal that there was no discussions on a second location. I immediately called the client after the call, and um, luckily, there was no second location. The vendor made a mistake, but everybody on the call looked deeply concerned. And I, I received a lot of texts and phone calls from, from my counterpart. Um, so we don't want to be um, uh, educated by the buyer uh, on anything, frankly, anything material. These are some of the areas of review. Um, that typically are, are looked at in, in great detail on a target. And I hope I don't mess this up. I'm going to um, I'm going to show you a different document. Um, it's a due diligence document <clears throat> that highlights uh, what we're looking at there as far as the different areas that we want to look in. So everybody see this Excel spreadsheet? Looks like it's it's up on the screen share. This was this was from a deal where we represented a, a parts manufacturer in the aerospace um, engineering industry. And the buyer was a, a very sophisticated um, French organization that operated internationally. And they did a really deep dive on everything. And they presented to us this spreadsheet, which I actually like. It's a little bit over the top, but it's it's interactive. You can see there all the different categories here. The, the, the general category, the number of requests, the amount of requests that we've closed and the amount that, that remain. And we have this percentage and a pie chart here showing how well we've done. And this deal of the 334, I think we ended up closing over 320. So that was that was a big win. And we had to fight with them to not close the rest because it wasn't practical. Um, but you'll see 
here, the different um, categories within each tab. This is the general corporate tab. It'll give you a sense of the type of information that a buyer is going to want to look at. So when I when I say that um, to beat a dead horse, that it's it's stressful. I'm I'm tasking people within the organization with finding all of this. So um, lots, lots to go through here, um, but it's helpful. And, and we can do a, we can do a pared down version of, of this spreadsheet. Very, very comprehensive spreadsheet, um, but it just illustrates the level of, of review uh, that's involved here. And I got these from the spreadsheet. Okay. So next page. Uh, no one buys a company just because they have clean uh, corporate records or that their reporting practices are sound, but they definitely will hesitate if that's not the case. And I've seen deals get completely derailed because that's not the case. Um, I have it. I have a deal where. The corporate records are fine. Every all the reporting is fine, with the exception of how they calculate their AR, and it's very peculiar. The company has X amount of AR in any given month, but that's not with financials, and that's not what they're reporting for purposes of determining EBITDA for a purchase price. They just report what they feel might be collectible. And it's a judgment call on one person's part um, based on, on their experience. And, and so the buyer has deep consider the price that they're paying is based on it on a, a sound principle and based on, on verifiable um, reporting. So that, that has really delayed things in that transaction and, and caused a lot of concern. And so the company could have um, fixed that if, if there was enough lead time, which there wasn't in this transaction, they could have fixed it in a way that wasn't perfect, but certainly um, not just the way that it has. So um, reporting is very important, but no one's gonna buy a company just because you have good reporting. Um, but it is helpful um, during the deal for efficiency sake. I talked about the quality of earnings um, earlier. The quality of earnings is, is a, a critical component because what it provides is visibility. Uh, visibility on um, vulnerabilities that exist within the company's uh, operations and financial reporting and how they make their money and how they spend their money. Uh, because a financial statement on its face can be very, very misleading. And um, oftentimes there's lots of adjustments. Sometimes adjustments aren't black and white, like the company owner bought a Ferrari and wants to expense it, that's easy. Um, sometimes they're blurred. And so we have to really understand um, how, we're, how we're reporting, what it's for, and what vulnerabilities exist. Because if, if we're um, setting a purchase price based on an EBITDA, for example, which is a, a common approach, then the EBITDA needs to be supported. And so the buyer is going to do this every time. The sellers don't often do this, and I and I, my sense is that there's uh, fee sensitivities. There's always concern on the sell side. Well, I shouldn't say always. Oftentimes, there's a concern on the sell side of sunk costs. What if we don't have a deal? What if I hire the attorneys and the CPA and the quality of earnings, and we don't end up getting a deal? And and I would say that that's obviously a possibility because a, a deal is not guaranteed until the money flows. Um, but what you're doing is you're enhancing your ability to support your price. Uh, you're enhancing your ability to support your networking capital, which is a, a, a critical component of a closing. And, um, and you are addressing issues along the way. 
So it's not a complete sunk cost. And I can appreciate the concern there, but without it, uh, it it's, it's hard to say exactly what the financial impact would be, but um, I would argue strongly that you're, you're likely going to lose more um, in value at the end of the day um, and not having a quality of earnings than the cost of the report itself. And I think it probably is going to far exceed the cost of the report. Oh, oh, excuse me. Ownership alignment. This is something that's easy to, um, to push to the back burner. Sometimes you're going to have minority owners who are not involved. They're passive. Uh, you might have a group of employees that have um, options of some sort or, or a, 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 an avenue to get equity under certain conditions. And those documents that govern the relationship between those various groups are not always crystal clear that the majority ownership can dictate to these minority owners. Sometimes these minority owners have rights. And I, I had a deal over the summer. It wasn't so much my deal. We had a client that was a 15% owner of a company and the client urgently called us and said, we need, we need you to look at these deal documents because the company that I, I own a piece of uh, looks like they're going to sell. The company uh, governing documents required 90% approval for this transaction. Our guy was 15%. The deal attorneys who represented the majority group uh, presented a very complex, lengthy document I think it was in the 80 to 90 page range for the definitive document and said, we have to close in two days. And, and that really kind of rubbed the, uh, the client the wrong way and, and often does um, when people are encountered with this situation where they feel like they're being forced into something that maybe they don't have to do. I thought that that was a really a bad move. We ended up agreeing to it. So all is well. Uh, after we looked at the documents, but uh, I've seen scenarios where the minority owner does not agree, and and now they have significant leverage, and that's really the last thing you want. And and oftentimes, just um, addressing the situation at an earlier stage, at the appropriate stage, there's always confidentiality concerns, but at an earlier stage, really goes a long way in creating goodwill with people because they feel like they're part of the process. Um, so that's, as I've seen, just kind of the, the human element. Um, you don't want to dictate on people if they, they have the leverage to not comply. So talked about investment bankers. Um, I think a, a good investment banker is is worth their fee um, without a question as a general matter. And um, I am very sensitive about engaging investment bankers too early or having an engagement that is too broad for the circumstances. And so it's important that when discussions with investment bankers are ongoing about what the relationship is going to look like, that we receive as much information as we can regarding what the process is going to look like, uh, what the valuation methodology is going to be, what their thoughts are on valuation, and perhaps most importantly, how we're going to go to market. Because the engagement agreements with investment bankers often have a tail period where if we terminate the engagement and we close a deal within, say, 12 or 18 months after termination, uh, if we close a deal with somebody that the investment banker introduced, the banker gets their fee. And so I like to be fair on the one hand, but on the other hand, appropriately narrow who that group of potential buyers is going to be. Effectively, I want to be able to say yes or no, you can send our information to that buyer or that buyer. Um, and I'd like to have an explanation from the banker why they feel it's appropriate that they're going to go after one buyer. This way, they're not, again, sending it out to hundreds of potential buyers um, without any real thought. 
And, and the result of that scenario, which I have seen play out is you do a deal with one of those buyers who the, the principal may not even be aware that that person was contacted and you do a deal within this tail period and a big fee is due, even though there was no work done or very little work, relatively speaking. Um, I had that happen two years ago. A client engaged us and they told us about this investment banker. We looked at it and uh, we tried to negotiate, but the investment banker had a very strong position and the client, I think, ended up selling for $34 million. The banker didn't do anything. And the banker got a million four, roughly, I think it was. So again, I want to be fair. Anybody who provides services, um, valuable services, I think should get paid. Uh, but you just have to be careful uh, with these agreements. Uh, so now into the deal. A lot of work goes into the transaction globally to get to the point where we're standing in front of a buyer and we're talking about an NDA or we're talking about a term sheet. This presentation doesn't really focus on that. Uh, the investment bankers, good ones, will be doing a lot of work behind the scenes leading up to this deal. And then in, in parallel, uh, counsel and the various advisors will be um, tasked with what's in their wheelhouse to get the company ready to do the pre-transaction diligence, et cetera. Uh, but once we're here, the first thing we tend to, to sign is a non-disclosure agreement. Um, and that will set the stage as to who and how, who information is gonna be provided to and how that information is gonna be used. Really important. I've closed transactions where uh, the identity of all of the customers was not provided until wires were initiated. That caused some heartburn um, with, with our counterparties because they wanted the visibility, but the, the client from the beginning, the stage and said, there are no circumstances am I gonna tell you who these people are specifically. We provided some level of detail that gave the buyer comfort that we were dealing with obviously real businesses and that the financials were real. Um, but, but we did not disclose them until the very end. Now that's, that's unique, but, uh, but the NDA sets the stage in, in that regard. So the next one, again, there are so many different structural options in a deal. And there is absolutely no single rule that says one is better than the other. Um, I'm doing two transactions for uh, similar companies operating in different territories um, that are owned by the same client. And the client came to me and said, we absolutely have to do an equity deal for, for both of these. And so we dug in and we're doing an equity deal in one and an asset deal in the other. And we just could not have been able to tell unless we really dug into the tax attributes. And in, in this case, attributes that existed outside of the deal itself um, that would be combined on the same tax return. So uh, really important to just not have a one size fits all approach and just take a, a more thoughtful and methodical approach on structure. And this absolutely applies on the buy sell side too. Term sheets, um, in a perfect world, we would have done the work and we would know intimately what's happening with an organization um, and, and as a result, uh, the, the term sheet's very detailed. Even on the, on the buy side, the buy side can be okay conceptually with a detailed term sheet, even though they have not been able to do the deep digging that they're ultimately going to do because they have comp uh, confidence that the cell team has done this and that the cell team 
understands the implications of each provision of the term sheet and that all the parties agree that going forward, what we should really be doing here is confirmatory diligence, confirming everything that's been verbalized by the cell team. Um, and it's not a, an exploration um, type activity where we have no idea what's going to happen. But in order to do this, whether we're on the buyer or the sell side, it does require either a lot of work or somebody on the buy on the sell side um, just uh, taking too much of a risk and just hoping that um, binding themselves isn't going to be a problem, even though they haven't done the work. Uh, but oftentimes, we entered into a term sheet recently with a client uh, where it was one page and, and there was very little detail. And uh, the idea was that there were certain circumstances existing that required us to, uh, that to, as a practical matter, lock up the seller. And there was just not enough runway to, um, to really drill down. And so from the buyer's standpoint, if we can tie up the seller for an appropriate period of time during an exclusivity period, uh, then we feel comfortable that if things, we might have sunk costs at the end of the day, uh, but we really didn't have a choice. If we wanted the deal, we had to just tie them up and, um, and we'll do our diligence. And if we don't like the deal, we terminate. Um, so that obviously can happen. And again, just depending on the circumstances. Uh, but in a perfect world, I like more detail, if, if at all possible. Uh, consideration. We have just three general categories, um, cash, burnout, and rollover. Cash is great because it's a known thing. You can, you know, it's, it's, uh, it doesn't change uh, subject to the indemnity obligations, of course, post-closing. Uh, it provides certainty. It doesn't have some of the upside that um, that earnouts and rollovers have, but um, it also doesn't have some of the downside. Earnouts are great, but what I've found is that oftentimes they're a little pie in the sky. They're um, they're unrealistic. Um, earnouts are structured sometimes where we have a, a big number, forty million dollars, and and. 20 of it is an earnout and 20 is cash. And the client can be happy saying, I, you know, I sold my company for $40 million. And, and that's very misleading because if the earnout methodology and how they're calculating whatever the, the, uh, the measurable is, um, whether it's EBITDA or something else, the methodology needs to be really sound. You need to drill down and, um, be very pessimistic from a sell side perspective. Is this realistic? Is, is this feasible given our trajectory, given our past um, performance, given the impending transition between the two organizations converge and there's culture changes and things of that nature? There's a lot of uncertainty. And um, for, for that reason, you, you have to be really careful um, and again, the flip side of the coin from the buyer standpoint is is the same thing. We don't we don't want to be um, laissez faire about it and and um, not really put pressure on on the team to perform post closing. So obviously, the buyer is going to try to have a higher target uh, before those additional money be paid out. Um, there are obvious positives. To both sides, from the buyer, you don't have to put up as much cash, which is wonderful. Um, you get more certainty. If if the earnout um, benchmarks are achieved, then great. We're happy to pay the cash because we've seen the performance. Um, from the sell side, you can get if if there are synergies to be had between the two organizations, there may be more profit potential. And um, and you could also spread out your tax impact over time, uh, which is which is helpful. Um, but oftentimes your your buyer might have significantly more resources uh, or relationships than the target, and for that reason, the potential 
for revenue growth in a buyer's hands may be significantly more than in the hands of the owner of the target. Um, and so earnouts can be attractive from that standpoint. Rollover consideration, uh, you know, keeping skin in the game for the sell side, uh, making sure that if there's ongoing covenants, uh, if there's if there is a reliance in particular, if there is a reliance on a seller principal, perhaps because the seller principal holds key relationships um, with customers or vendors or other important third parties, we want to make sure that that seller principal is going to stay around. And if they've held back, say, 40% of their purchase price and reinvested it in the buyer structure, then that helps ensure that there's going to be a level of cooperation there that is satisfactory. Um, sellers very often underestimate the need to do their diligence on the buyer before they do their rollover. A rollover is just a nice way of saying investment. And if I if the proposal is that I'm going to roll over $10 million of a $30 million transaction, I'm investing $10 million in the buyer. That's how it should be viewed. I, I need to do diligence. I need to understand uh, the financials of the buyer. I need to understand operationally what's happening, legal issues, basically all of the same things that the buyer needs to understand about a target. And I think that this is oftentimes lost on a seller and they just take at face value the valuation that the buyer attributes to this investment. And I think that's a mistake. And I think this is this is one of those key factors where at the outset of the negotiations, expectations need to be set regarding the level of diligence that's going to be required in order for all the parties to, to have a comfort level on this investment. Uh, the other thing that you'll often see, and, and I'll just take a, a step back, um, earnout. What you'll see is that the buyer will have some kind of uh, debt and and the bank will uh, will have covenants and they'll have restrictive covenants. And those restrictive covenants may disallow certain um, cash outlays unless uh, uh, debt service coverage ratios are being achieved. Unless the company is doing well, the bank does not want cash to go away. And as a result, the bank is going to require oftentimes the seller to subordinate their position on the earnout payment uh, to the lender's interests. And lenders feel very passionate about this. And this can be a real issue, a real sticking point, because what we're saying is, okay, we meet these earnouts, but you're telling me that I might not get payment or I might not get payment for a certain period of time. And depending on what the restrictive covenant says, yes, that's that's what is being proposed. And so when it comes to doing diligence on a buyer, it's important, even in the earnout uh, scenario, we need to understand what those covenants look like and we need to understand what the levers are to allow or disallow uh, such a payment. And, and further, on a, on a rollover investment, when I'm putting that money in the buyer, I need to understand what are the governing documents that I'm going to be subject to. How can I exit? Is there going to is this going to be an illiquid investment? Probably. Um, what control will I have? Oftentimes, very little. Um, you know, what does the capitalization table look like? Are there people who are standing in front of me? What does the debt look like? All of that is is really as a practical matter, very important. Am I going to be able to get this money and under what circumstances? So, um, so um, the, the sell team meddling in their affairs, which is kind of funny because that's exactly what, what they, they've been doing and what they expect to do. So um, it kind of goes both ways. Um, 
So I'll, I'll try to kind of speed through this because we're just 1248. Networking capital, uh, the amount of essentially assets that, that is left in the business that is required for the buyer to step into the seller's shoes, continue to run the business, have a smooth transition and pay short-term obligations as they become due with the goal that the buyer doesn't want to have to invest additional money into the business and, and effectively increase the purchase price. So there's a certain amount of money that tends to stay back um, to meet those short-term obligations. It's a dollar for dollar impact, the implication to the, to the buyer and to the seller um, on how this is, um, where it lands. And this is part of the quality of earnings process on both sides, where they're looking at a trailing six, nine, or 12 month um, balance sheet analysis and coming up with this number. And, and again, it is a highly negotiated item and um, oftentimes something that can be lost in the shuffle until towards the end of a deal. And that is a mistake. Um, that's something that should be top priority because this is something that could derail a transaction. Uh, in in the, the agreement, there's going to be lots of representations and warranties, oftentimes uh, 30 to 40 different pages filled with factual statements uh, that the seller is going to make. If we've done all that work uh, before we engage with a buyer, then this process is, is significantly easier. Um, and and we're, we're spreading... A, a certain amount of work, we're spreading it over a longer period of time. So it's more palatable for all involved. If we wait until we're parties and the underlying company related documents and customer contracts, et cetera, uh, it's definitely feasible, but everybody needs to uh, be prepared for what's to come and, and it's going to be much more intense. Um, only thing to add here is that subject to confidentiality concerns, it's important to get the right people to weigh in on the right information. One person doesn't necessarily know everything. And so um, of, of those 30 to 40 pages, there might be 30 different categories of information um, from HR to accounting, finance, operational, legal, um, that one would need to weigh in on in order to, to have a clear picture as to whether the rep is correct or not. If it's not correct, then we need to disclose that. We need to disclose how it's not correct. And that's where our disclosure schedules come in. They work hand in hand with our reps and warranties. And between the two, this is the, the mechanism through which we're allocating this between the buyer and the seller. And, and so the, the buyer will have all of these statements um, in the reps and warranties that are meant to solicit additional information, um, either disclosures or perhaps responsive documentation. Um, maybe the rep calls for a copy of the financials to be, um, to be attached. Um, <clears throat> post-closing indemnities, this is, you know, on the sell side, largely yeah, I view my job is to document the deal terms, obviously, but also uh, make sure that we're keeping money in the seller's pockets. And so we have baskets and, and caps in which we're, we're capping the total liability that can stem from breaches of the agreement um, and, and defining the mechanism through which an indemnity claim um, uh, may be made. And then survival periods, you're gonna make a statement in a purchase agreement, but unless the buyer comes back and makes a claim based on the inaccuracy of that statement within a specified period of time, they waive their rights. So these are limiting factors to give comfort to a seller. And obviously the parties have complete opposite positions on, on all of these issues. Um, the last thing here that I have is a closing. 
there is a lot of documents, a lot of coordination that's required, disclosure schedules, because they consist of financials and sometimes large agreements themselves, they can be over a thousand pages long. Our negotiated definitive documents and all the ancillary documents and things that go with that, that might be a couple hundred pages. There might be third party consents. There's lots of different moving parts. You got to have a closing checklist and you got to work with your counterpart um, to make sure that we're assigning responsibilities on every single item in that checklist to make sure that somebody's tasked with the work. Um, and this is something that you start you know, well in advance of a closing. Um, so it's 1253 and that is the end. So I'll, uh, I'll open up if, if anybody has any, any questions. I'm just looking at some of the comments here. So Andrew had a positive experience. That's good. Um, I don't know what your role was in that, Andrew, but um, Catherine, positive. That That's really good. I was expecting more negatives here. Um, I have a question. So I was someone who does a lot of M&A and I'm in-house. What, in your perspective, as an outside counsel doing M&A, can in-house lawyers do to make it like working together more seamless? Or how do we add the most value to a transaction? Yeah, that's a great, great question. Um, so that that comprehensive due diligence checklist is is helpful, um, and um, any comprehensive due diligence checklist that is provided in the context of an M and A transact transaction is helpful because it identifies all of the various areas that a buyer would find important to look at. And the good news is that even if you did not have a buyer, they're all important um, to a degree. All of these issues are important to address generally. And so I think it's helpful to look at something like that and, and pose the question of whether, is this something that is um, part of our process to look at, to update, to be cognizant of, or is this not even something that is on anyone's radar? And if, if that's the case, the question is, does that matter? Because it's going to change based on each organization. But it, it's certainly more than just doing corporate minutes. Obviously, there's so much that in-house counsel has knowledge of um, that you're able to um, influence others. And, and so I would say as a general risk, if you look at a comprehensive checklist and and go one by one and ask yourself whether it's relevant to the organization um, as a threshold matter, and then secondarily, whether it's being addressed or not. And, and if it's not, then I think that's something that you probably think about, does it make sense to, to clean this up or to address it? Because it seems like there's a hole there. Does that answer your question? Alexa? Yeah, I know. Thank you. I think, I mean, I agree. I think that the other way we help, right, is us being that internal quarterback where from and just making sure and also kind of being the person who can help communicate risk tolerance to the outside lawyers is often good of, you know, you, know, you, you can give us the this is what's market better than we can, but we can say yes, but here's our tolerance level or what we're worried about. But I think we're all on the same page of yeah, what is absolutely necessary? Keep your checklist updated. Um, maybe sometimes stopping your internal team from using diligence to do all the integration planning. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, there, there's so much context that that you could provide to someone like myself that's really helpful because what you're you're looking at things much differently than an owner. You know, owners tend to um, owners who are not lawyers uh, tend to dismiss complexity. Oftentimes I found, um, or they don't appreciate what the real issues are. Um, and, and I most certainly am not uh, trying to create issues out of nowhere, but at the same time, the, when you look at how these indemnities work in a purchase agreement and how they tie into the reps and warranties, it's pretty clear pretty quickly that we have to have a handle on all of this that we're making statements about. Otherwise there's gonna be big trouble. Um, and that's the whole purpose of the indemnity. 
Um, and, and it's something that if you do that, do it the right way, there should not be indemnity claims post-closing. It's very rare um, that I see deals that we've worked on where we we were able to do all the diligence with the way we should have and worked with all the appropriate parties where there's actually a claim. Because once we do that, everything is transparent and, and out there for everybody to consider. And yeah, Ted, I I think the same thing every time I see these closing statements, uh, when I look at the fees, <laughs> it's, it's pretty unbelievable. Um, but with that said, we just did a deal. Well, we almost got a deal done. Um, we were preparing signature packets, which means the deal was done. And we were ready to load it up into DocuSign. The latest month financials for that client came out. The buyer was already waffling and it was just too soft for the buyer and they pulled the plug. So we pay, we bill hourly. And we got paid and the, the investment banker did it despite all of their work. So um, I will give them credit for that level of risk that they take. Just want to make sure Adam uh, Chinook's question gets answered. It's a good one about um, the kind of take on the M&A market for their balance of the year. And, and I would add to that, you know, any sectoral differences, you know, aerospace and defense, for example, um, is cost of capital hurting deal volume or you know, is it a kind of a rush to do it before year end as usual? Yeah, I, I've seen an impact. Um, you know, my my sample side certainly is not marketplace as a whole, but uh, but for the first time in, in, in really my fifteen years, so most of my career, I've seen this. Uh, with the economy and and I am industry agnostic. So whenever there's activity, um, we see we see deals come across. But as of late, I've seen four deals in the past uh, nine months um, that I'm involved with that have slowed or stopped entirely because of directly because of cost of capital um, and and to a lesser extent because of um, softening performance, like the one I just described. Um, I think they use that as a, as the reason for, for going away from that transaction. But we had a lot of Intel in the background that there was a lot of heartburn on the buyer's part on the cost of their capital. Um, so I have seen that. I don't know if it's representative of the market, but everybody who I speak to who operates in this space, um, are, are kind of, telling the same story. Appreciate it. Yeah, I suspected it, but it's good. You, you have the deal volume to give us more insight on that. Um, so much appreciated. And um, I don't know if you're available for more questions, but uh, on behalf of ACC, sure. thanks very much for uh, doing this for us today. Great presentation. Uh, Audrey usually distributes the slides if, if those are available for those who uh, attended. So. Um, I you know, really appreciate it and uh, Higgs for, for uh, sponsoring it. Absolutely. Happy to do it. Thanks for having me. And um, I, I will hang back here for a little bit if there are, are questions and um, my contact information is on the slide. So uh, if I can be a resource um, or make a connection um, with other folks, um, happy to do so or answer questions. <laughs> Thanks again. Yeah.